Welcome to K-State Now with Kansas State University President Richard Myers. I'm Richard Baker. We had a recent event here at Kansas State, uh, an effort to bring the university together, KSU Night. Uh, what do you think came out of all of that? Well, first, I, I think it was important to do something like that because not just Kansas State, but other campuses are feeling the, the impact of, of um, sort of the national tone empowering fringe groups to be more vocal on campuses and, and, and espousing principles that, of course, we wouldn't stand for uh, on our campus. But they nevertheless are doing that. And so people are, are concerned, and we wanted to address that concern in a, in a way that would sort of, if you would, kind of sort of reset the problem for us here at K-State so we can, can move forward. We think we're on a, a long journey. Case Unite was just one step on that journey. A powerful one, I'd say, because we had three to 4,000 people, faculty, staff, and students show up. Great support uh, for the event. Um, out of that came some uh, seven, I think it was seven breakout groups in the union. We're still gathering that data, but we have several ways forward. And uh, that'll be, uh, we've, we've had some of these in the mill, in the hopper already, trying to bring them forward, but uh, we're still moving forward on those, those ideas. We had some incidents that had nothing to do with Kansas State University. How much did our reaction to those and those incidents themselves influence what we did? Um, well, I think, I think for the most part, for the recent instances, our reactions have been fairly, fairly decent. But even if an incident is not related to K-State but happens in our community, it still has an impact on uh, K-State students, faculty, and staff. So the incident of the car painting that was not related to the university uh, had a huge impact on this community, and, and it made people afraid and um, uh, disgusted and all those sorts of things. And so you'd like to say, well, that happened, you know, off campus, a private affair. Uh, it is, but it's not because we're part of the community. We have students that live out that way. And uh, until we figured out, until the Raleigh County Police figured out what happened in the FBI, or yes, and um, you know, you have to respond. You have to, you have to be, you, you have to address people's concerns if they feel afraid because of something like that before you even know why. Uh, so I, I think our responses were actually pretty measured in all that. And I think this, um, just a whole national tone when it comes to things like immigration, DACA, um, white supremacy, I, I, it could be stronger at the national level, in my opinion. And it's, 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 it's good we're having those discussions here and, uh, and trying to make this community sort of uh, a beacon for others on how to address these issues. How do you draw a line between hate speech and free speech? Oh, it's, it's uh, pretty clear the, the, the law is, uh, the Constitution, the amendment's clear, but, but then the law applying that is, is pretty clear as well. So, uh, and this is part of the educational process for a lot of folks on campus. Um, speech that disgusts you, that upsets you, that most of us feel is inappropriate, is uh, most often protected by the First Amendment. You can't, you can't say, you can't say that to me. When it, uh, when it intimidates somebody, uh, uh, has the potential to create violence, then you're, then you're, may not be protected by the First Amendment. So it's, it's, um, but just a, a, a white supremacy poster on campus is, is, that's protected by the First Amendment. Um, so we can take them down um, and so forth, and we do, of course. And we can uh, denounce the ideas, and uh, but we also have to be resilient. That there's a certain segment of society that's always going to be outside the mainstream, espousing ideas that are either disgusting or or um, make us fearful. Um, I would give you the the incident of the the Westboro the, the, the Westboro Baptist Church as an example. Uh, when they first started coming to military funerals, because uh, we had gay and lesbians serving in the military, and they denounced that at military funerals. Horrific stuff if you're the parents of a military person who has died. Uh, but 
over time, they've become they they've become ineffective. They stand in front of McCain from time to time, and everybody ignores them. Yeah, we we know they're a hate group. We got it. We just ignore them. Uh, we got to do that. We have to do the same thing with hate posters. All these sorts. We have to become more resilient to that piece of it, um, and, and try to and try to build a community that just doesn't tolerate that, and where we don't have members that are that feel like they have to express themselves in in those hateful ways. So that's so. But there is a line, and and free speech is important, and we're that's part of the educational process as well. And we'll we'll have speakers that come in. And we'll talk about that. That's part of the the follow on journey. So it's. You know, it's it's part listening, it's part education, it's part working together. All of us. KU Unite was not just an administration thing; it was the whole campus, as people saw, trying to uh, raise our community up uh, to to the aspirational values that we call community principles, and to do that with the with uh, Manhattan, the city, and our and the community we live in. We all want to be we be at our, and be a place where people want to come, feel safe, and can be all they can be, if you will. We have students here from all over Kansas, from outside Kansas. A lot of them come from communities where they do not have minority <clears throat> groups, or at least don't have very many. It seems like to me that for a number of reasons, some of the responsibility, a lot of the responsibility for educating about diversity, fairly or unfairly, has fallen on the shoulders of Kansas State. I think it does when you come to campus, and you're you're right. Some folks come from uh, communities which where people look just like them, whether they're people of color or <clears throat> or others. Um, and I think my focus is on making sure that we, we K State, prepare these students for the real world. And the real world is going to be diverse. And the real world is going to focus on inclusion. That is the key word here. We, we have to acknowledge diversity. That's the reality of it. But our aspiration is that we become inclusive, that everybody is part of the, uh, of the, of the group. And that's what they're going to find when they get out in the real world. The private sector uh, demands inclusion. They measure it. They, all the companies, the boards I was on for, huge companies in this country. Uh, we spent a lot of time at the board level talking about uh, diversity in terms of how diverse the board was, how diverse uh, senior management was, but beyond the differences that to make sure everybody was included, that, that inclusion was our was our the important word in this whole discussion. And so uh, we owe that to our students to prepare them for going out in the in the real world. And so you have some other questions here. I'll talk about some of the programs we have that will, will help us in that. Well, I went to the group that discussed about getting diversity into the classroom and how we could do that. The university right now is in an effort to bring the number of classes to graduate down to 120. What does this do to faculty members and how they teach diversity or how they bring diversity into the classroom when you're also lowering the number of hours well, at the same time. There's going to be a tension, and, and you mentioned lowering the hours. That's a uh, Kansas Board of Regents objective is to get, uh, get our degree granting programs down to 120 hours of coursework. Um, there will be exceptions to that, probably not many, uh, and I think, I think that's a good objective. I think it's, 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 a, it's a decent objective. Um, but to then trying to integrate our what we call the K-State Eight, the eight courses, in into a student's experience, and those courses can be uh, uh, around diversity, uh, if you will, uh, is harder. It's going to be harder. But there are other things we can do besides just coursework. But we are working the K-State Eight, and that, as you know, as a faculty member, that's that takes um, a, a lot of people to to approve those and find out how they're going to integrate into the into our academic programs. Uh, Arts and Sciences has done something very interesting. They have a, uh, they have a diversity overlay that overlays uh, all their departments and all their degrees. Uh, it was uh, developed and helped along with uh, uh, their diversity point person, uh, uh, Kamathi uh, uh, who, who, who put this together in a way that they expect all their arts and students that are majoring there to take uh, what Dr. Choma said is uh, uh, this overlay and, and help improve their understanding of, of, uh, 
uh, increase their cultural competency, I guess is a good way to put it. And, uh, and that's going to be done inside the 120 hours. So there's one college that's kind of figured out, uh, and the largest college here on campus, figured out a, a way to do that. That's helpful. It may be a model that we can use other places. But we have other ways of doing it. We have the, uh, this, um, let, me, let me just look at my note here, because I, I want to get this right, because this is, it, this is uh, pretty, pretty involved. But we've got a, um, a process that's called Intercultural Development Inventory. And it's, uh, it's a program that was being conducted uh, by a specialist in research and extension. Uh, we've taken uh, a couple of those specialists, one in particular, and, uh, and, and she's made herself available to our senior team. So the senior administrators, we're going through this, uh, the development uh, inventory. Uh, the deans are doing it. Uh, it's, it's, it's getting widely deployed. Once we go through this inventory and we have a sense of what it's about, it's, it's something that we may, if we can afford it, deploy to all freshmen. And it is, it's all about cultural competency. You, you do a survey, and it, and it kind of tells you where you are on a scale, not good, bad, or indifferent. This is kind of what your competency is. And then it gives you things you can do, some of them fairly simple, but things you can do to increase your cultural competency. It's been employed at other universities. I think Purdue's done it in other places. It's, um, it seems to have great potential. We're in the middle right now. The, uh, the president's cabinet, all the senior administrators are in the middle of, of this process right now. And we're finding it really, really helpful. And so I... All that goes to say, back to what, what the question you ask, uh, a lot of it is left to higher education. But if, if they don't have cultural competency coming in, we got to make sure they have it when they get their degree, because that's the world they're going to go join. They're going to have to be culturally competent or they'll be irrelevant. And so it, if it's up to us, it's up to us, and we'll get that done. We're about, what, two months away from the start of the legislative session? Yeah. Does any of this impact on how we approach the legislature? Well, I, I think in several ways. One is, um, you know, if we're appropriately funded uh, by the state, then that gives us flexibility to institute some programs, some of which I just talked about, the, uh, the inventory piece, uh, intercultural development inventory. It would give us a chance to implement that perhaps where otherwise we might not have the money to do it because that, that requires training people. It, it, it's, a, it's a program that costs to get the, the materials and so forth. <clears throat> so that's, that's one way they can do it. Um, the legislature uh, already authorized or directed some commissions, commissions on Hispanics, commissions on uh, African Americans. Um, these commissions exist. They're doing, uh, the government appointed these commissioners. <clears throat> I think it'd be useful for the legislature to ask these commissions to report out. What do you find in Kansas about these various, excuse me, I gotta, <coughs> about these, uh, these, these, these various groups? And that would be, I think, uh, uh, illuminating. Um, they could also talk about uh, the kind of courses that are uh, taught in K through 12. Why leave it to just the university? If you've, if you've come from communities that are uh, not as diverse as, as the world they're going to find if they, if they go to a major metropolitan area or a, a big company somewhere, then maybe there's room in K through 12 to teach or make people aware of, make them more sensitive to, to different cultures and, and so forth. So I think there's a, there's a lot they could, they could do. And, and, and just supporting higher education. Higher education, uh, according to all the studies in a, in a Federal Reserve study, I think we mentioned it last time, the way you increase economic prosperity is through education and, and people with good ideas. Higher education plays a key role there. So if we want to, if we really want to work the diversity issue, uh, we enable people to come out of, uh, come into the middle class, uh, well-educated, and they're much more likely to understand these issues, be willing to understand these issues. Uh, it's going to help with with their personal prosperity and wealth. And, uh, and so I think, I think what the state does around higher education can have a huge impact on how this state looks at, at, our, at diversity and inclusion. And our state demographics are changing right before our very eyes. And, uh, and mainly, uh, not mainly, but uh, a good example is Southwest Kansas where there are a lot of Hispanic Latino farm workers and families. And some of those 
children from those families are now here in school as first generation students doing exactly what I just described, getting an education. Uh, they'll be able to rise with that education into the middle class if they're not already there uh, or higher. And uh, it's going to give them all the tools then to be successful in life. And that's, I think the legislature has a big role to play in this, frankly. Multi-aspects. Multi One last quick question. Speaking of the legislature, mm -hmm. are we going to look at more cuts this year? I don't think we know yet. They passed a, uh, you know, they passed a two-year budget last year. They'll uh, look at all that this year. Um, uh, we're, we're hopeful they'll continue doing what they said they were going to do last year, which is restore the major cuts we got a, a year or so ago. They restored part of that in this fiscal year. We're hoping in the next fiscal year they'll restore the rest of it. Those are, that's several million dollars to K-State, a, a little bit more to KU. Um, everybody benefits from, from this restoration of that, that cut, and that goes into our base budget. If they do that, uh, I think most, most universities and, and senior leadership would be really uh, happy about that. So that's, that's going to be our, our push. Um, and that they also may do something more about uh, uh, compensation because the, the bill they put together at the end of the last session had some, um, some, some holes in it and they may be willing to fill those holes. So uh, I've heard that uh, with the new tax plan that uh, revenues in the, in the first quarter they measured were uh, exceeded expectations, uh, that would be a good thing. And so I, I, I think we're hopeful that we can go along with what was passed in FY, uh, for FY18 as it follows into 19, and that's what we're hoping for, and okay. that's what we're planning for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. This has been K-State Now with Kansas State University President Richard Myers. I'm Richard Baker.